All right, so we're moving into a chapter on refrigeration and heat pump systems. Uh, well, first, uh, you've been exposed to refrigeration cycles in the previous prerequisite course, Thermo 1. So what we do is we will uh, not go as slow in the introduction as we typically do because you've been exposed to, hopefully, the Carnot refrigeration cycle as well as a vapor compression refrigeration. And then you can have the same thing for the heat pump. So what about the Carnot refrigeration cycle? Well, it's made up of four components, two to transfer the heat. They're heat exchangers. One would be the condenser and one the evaporator. All right, what's happening in the evaporator? Well, this is a P for evaporator. The heat is being transferred in that heat exchanger from some low temperature reservoir, if you want to call it that. You're going to take heat out of it without changing the temperature. Often we call that a reservoir. And then for the condenser, you're transferring some heat. You're dumping some heat, Q, to a high temperature reservoir, meaning as you dump the heat into it, it doesn't change the temperature. Okay, so this is dumping Q sub H and uh, transferring Q sub L. What uh, this is always interesting that I color coded what is the heat transfer with the condenser is red. And we talk about TH up there and QH up there. What about the, uh, if, uh, for the evaporator, TL and QL, right? So it's blue indicating cooler. Red indicating hotter. All right. So we have the refrigerant flowing through the condenser, and it comes out the condenser and goes into a device for the Carnot refrigeration cycle as a turbine. And then out of the evaporator goes through another device, compressor. and continues to cycle. So we have four states, four states. Uh, it really doesn't matter where you start numbering it because it's a cycle, but let's go ahead and talk about state one. That's what comes out of the evaporator, goes into the compressor. State two, state three, and state four. So the refrigerant is flowing in that direction through the devices. All right. <clears throat> now, for the Carnot, this means maximally efficient. Maximally efficient. And so what we want is um, it, it, the trick for being maximally efficient is to eradicate any irreversibilities. So the compressor is going to be maximally efficient. It's going to be a reversible compressor. It's isentropic uh, flow through that. Uh, same with the turbine, it'll be adiabatic, isentropic, well, adiabatic and reversible flow through either the turbine or the compressor means it's isentropic flow through, the pro through those devices. But what about other sources of irreversibilities? Well, in the condenser and in the evaporator, you have heat transfer, a great source of irreversibility. You know, just think about that. It's not just friction, but it's heat transfer through a large or a finite temperature difference. The larger the temperature difference, the greater the irreversibility. So anytime you have Q, Q, a heat transfer, you want to minimize the delta T that is needed to drive the heat transfer. That seems like an oxymoron. Hold it. To have good heat transfer, I put something that's hot in the contact with something that's cold. That promotes heat transfer, great heat transfer. But the large delta T makes it very irreversible. So what you want to do is you want to have a small delta T for the same Q so that you minimize the irreversibilities. Well, how small can small go in the limit in the Carnot? That's the limit, maximally efficient. Delta T goes to zero. So the refrigerant that's flowing through the condenser that's actually condensing in the condenser 
is at the same temperature as the reservoir that you're dumping the heat to. Make sense? So this refrigerant is always at TH as it's being condensed. That minimizes the irreversibilities in the condenser. How about in the evaporator? Same thing, we have refrigerant flowing through the evaporator. There's heat transfer coming out of that refrigerant, going somewhere, it's going into the, the low temperature reservoir, the sink, so to speak. I'm sorry, it's coming from the low temperature and coming into the fluid in the evaporator. And what you want is that the temperature of the fluid in the evaporator to be the same temperature as the reservoir. All right. If they are different, you have irreversibilities. You are not going to be maximally efficient. Okay. Well, what we want to do is analyze this system. First, we'll think, well, what's the work uh, needed to drive the compressor? Well, do a first law analysis around that. You'd find that H2 minus H1. What about the Q? Let me put a lowercase q here. Q sub, uh, in the uh, condenser. So per unit mass going through the condenser, what is the heat transfer out of the fluid? Well, it would be H2 minus H3. How about the work coming into the turbine? The drive that turbine, uh, which is, well, that's actually, actually, this is the work into the compressor. Sorry, this is coming out. You're generating a little bit of work out of the turbine. W sub T, which is H3 minus H4. And then the Q in the evaporator, it's being added to the fluid, is H1 minus H4. So we can talk about the work net needed, not that it's a per power producing cycle. This is not, this is refrigeration. It's a power consuming cycle, but we'll talk about the net power to drive it, to make it work. That's going to be WC minus WT. Okay, a little bit comes out of that turbine, which can back, be back you know, to, to reduce the energy consumption in the whole cycle to drive the compressor. So it's WC minus WT. And then we have a coefficient of performance for the refrigeration. What do you mean by coefficient of performance for refrigeration? What do I desire over what it costs or what makes it work? Something like that. What, does, what, what is the cost or what makes it work? So, what do we desire for a refrigeration system? There's a few choices. Maybe we'll do the clicker question. Let's do a clicker question. Everybody has their clickers. So, do I desire a, a large WC? Do I desire a large uh, Q condenser? Do I desire a large uh, WT? Do I desire a large uh, Q evap? So answer A, B, C, or D. What do I desire? That should be in the numerator of this coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle. Answer A, B, C, or D. All right, so basically a refrigeration cycle, you need to pull heat up out of something that's low temperature. That's the, that's the magic of a refrigeration cycle. You need to pump the heat uphill, just like you pump water uphill. It's easy to have water flow downhill, right? 
It's hard to get water to flow uphill. It's hard to get heat to be transferred from low temperature up the temperature and dumped to high temperature. So this is what's desired, isn't it? Isn't D what's desired? Hold it. How come we're not on the same page, people? Do you want to pay a large electric bill? Is that what you want? You want to make CPS uh, happy? No, we don't want to pay a large electric bill. We want to minimize the amount of energy we have to put into the cycle. We don't want to pay a lot. This is what we want. We want a large, so the coefficient of performance is going to be this Q evap. I want a large heat removal for every kilogram of fluid that's flowing in the loop. And then what about what does it, what makes it run or what does it cost? It's going to be the W net, what I we just worked out, what we have to purchase, net purchase from uh, some energy provider thinking about electricity to run the system. Wow, okay. Let's do this one. Let's say somebody says, uh, how about the coefficient of performance for a heat pump? Well, we don't have a lot of experience with heat pumps. Maybe a few of you are in an apartment or in a home that you know has a heat pump. Does anybody know if they're in an apartment or home that has a heat pump? One? Anybody else? So one out of, what, 40 people or 35 people in this room? That's not a large percentage. So usually, how about this? How many people have been in a car, own a car, or have been in a house, or, you know, parents own a house that has an air conditioner? Window, central, or in a car, it has an air conditioner. Okay, see, there's a lot more experience with air conditioners. But if you were up north, way up north, it would be like, nah, you don't need an air conditioner in the house. You don't need an air conditioner in a car. But you do need to stay warm in the nine months of winter that exist in Alaska or other places. So anyway, let's do this. Let's try to answer the harder question, the heat pump. What is the purpose of the heat pump and what would be, the, what would be needed in the numerator of the COP up here for the heat pump? Would it be A, a large WC, B, a large Q condenser, a large C, WT, or a large D, Q evaporator? What do, now we're talking about a heat pump. What is our numerator in the ratio of the definition of a heat pump coefficient of performance? Ready to take a look? Well, first of all, refrigeration heat pump systems are heat moving cycles, not power producing cycles. To move the heat, I have to provide power, I have to provide work, okay? But the purpose of a refrigeration system is when I plug it in and start to run it, the inside of my refrigerator gets cold. When I walk into my apartment or house or car and I want to now occupy that space, I want to turn the system on and I want it to cool it down. So that's the purpose of refrigeration. How about heat pumps? Okay, I have a house in the middle of winter. It's cold outside. I want the house when I walk into it to get warm, to pump heat inside the house. True? So that's a heat pump. So guess what? Don't you want a large Q in the condenser? You want to dump heat to high temperature to keep your warm house warm. All right, let's see how we did. Oh, look at that. You're waking up. Pretty good, huh? All right. So that's, that's your uh, coefficients of performance for this cycle. Now, to make this maximally efficient, you need all of the fluid to condense at the same temperature, okay? How can that happen? How can I transfer heat out of the working fluid in the condenser 
at the same temperature. Professor, if I transfer heat out of the fluid, the fluid's going to cool off. True? That's before thermo 1. But then in thermo 1, we learn, hey, it can condense. The fluid can condense. At constant pressure, it condenses at one and only one temperature, the saturation temperature. So I need the peg state 2 to be saturated vapor. And then when it condenses, it comes out saturated liquid. This is the traditional pegging it for state 2 and state 3. We're going to say state 2 is going to be saturated vapor, not superheated. And state 3 is going to be saturated liquid, not subcooled liquid. Now, if that then doesn't change pressure, that's our assumption that P2 is equal to P3, then it condenses at constant pressure, constant temperature. All right. What about down here? Well, you're going to have some quality at 4 that's going to be greater than 0. And then you're going to have some quality at 1 less than 1. So it's going to be a two-phase mixture going into the evaporator and coming out of the evaporator. But it's always going to be at that low pressure, the evaporator pressure, hence this constant temperature, the low temperature TL. What we find is that you have a high side, pressure side, high P, and a low P side. So really you only have two pressures. You have a high pressure, that's the pressure of the condenser. The inlet and the outlet of the condenser are at the same pressure, it's the high pressure. And the low side, the inlet and outlet of the evaporator, it has the same pressure. Okay. Now, we know these performance metrics, the coefficient of performance. How about if we put it on some property diagrams? Temperature entropy looks a little bit like this. The dome. Show me a line of constant pressure. Let's put on a line of constant pressure that's high pressure. That's pH. A line of low pressure. PL. Where would be state 1? State 1 or state 2? State 2, let's pick, uh, point, put state 2 on the diagram. High pressure, saturated vapor. Is that where state 2 is? And then high pressure, saturated liquid. Is that where state 3 is? Now, we have to know that it's isentropic flow through both the turbine and the compressor. So... State 4 is directly below 3, and state 1 is directly below 2. And it's at that low pressure. And so the cycle looks like this. It goes just a square. It's a box. It's a box with the corners at the, the upper corners inside the dome, pushed at, at, to, the, to the saturated liquid, saturated vapor lines. Make sense? All right. Apply it. Just struggle through a problem. Okay? So you pick a fluid, 22. It's a working fluid. You put it in the Carnot vapor refrigeration cycle. The evaporator temperature is 2 degrees C. Right away, I can say, okay, that's temperature of the evaporator is 2 degrees C. I could get the pressure in the evaporator. What's that? It's the saturation pr pressure at that temperature of 2 degrees C. Well, for R22, you can look that up. R22, its a pressure is around 531.3 kPa, kilopascal. Let's take a look at that number, 531 kilopascal. Is that absolute pressure or gauge pressure? Okay, clicker question. It's A, it's going to be absolute, B, gauge, and professor, I'd like a wrong answer. 
I'll let you vote for C if you want to vote for C, and you can say that. It definitely is wrong. I think some people do that on purpose. They say, I, I abandon my points on the clickers. I just want to. Uh, I said that the saturation pressure for R22 at 2 degrees C is 531. Is that kilopascal absolute or kilopascal gauge? Is it absolute pressure or is it gauge pressure? All right. Ran out of time? I thought I gave enough time to process it. Okay. Uh, I listened to an article coming in this morning about uh, anybody ever had any surgeries in the hospital and how fast they try to get you up and start walking? It is a royal pain. I had a hernia surgery a couple years ago. and It's like not even two hours. Get up, get up, get up. We can get up and hit you. That's what I want to do. <laughs> but uh, it's like I can't even move my leg. You want me to put it over the edge? Okay, wait until you get older and you have surgeries. You'll know what I mean. But now they're applying that to cognitive brain. And so that's what we were doing this morning. Get up, get up, get up. Use your brain. Use your brain. It's past eight. <laughs> Wake up. And uh, can you imagine? Anybody ever visit somebody that had a brain injury in the hospital? It's traumatic. It's like, and they let them lay there. And I think now the, the medical treatment's going to be changing where they're going to be forcing them to get up and do stuff, even with the brain injuries. Uh, anyway, that's a side issue. So let's see what we did today. Congratulations. It's absolute. It's an absolute pressure. Those, if you go to the table, if anybody had their appendices, they looked it up. They said 2 degrees C, refrigerant 22. They find uh, the saturation pressure. It was 531 kilopascal. Okay. Now, the fact the saturated vapor enters the condenser at 52 degrees C and saturated liquid exits the condenser at the same temperature. That's pegging those two corners on the TS diagram that we just talked about. The mass flow rate's given. So it says, calculate the rate of heat transfer to the refrigerant passing through the evaporator in kilowatts. Well, is that going to be Q? Maybe put a dot on it because it's a rate you want at kilowatts in the evaporator, right? Maybe we remind ourselves what was our temperature entropy diagram look like. Went like this. We had state box like that. State one, two, three, four. This is where you're having heat transfer out of the fluid in the condenser. This is where you're having heat transfer into the fluid in the evaporator. True. The refrigerant is flowing 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1. Okay. So Q dot in the evaporator. Mass flow rate times some change in the enthalpies. Well, which one is it? H1 minus H4. Let me ask this question. Is H1 greater than H4, H1 equal to H4, H1 less than H4. We will have a clicker question, A, uh, A, B, or C. Enthalpy at state 1, compare it to state 4. Is it greater than H4, equal to H4, or less than H4? Well, I know that we're showing on a temperature entropy diagram. Professor, it'd be a lot easier if you would have said S1 versus S4, right? But I, it's enthalpy. And what you have to think about is where is saturated vapor? Isn't this over here on this side vapor? And over on this side, liquid? And think about you're not changing the temperature, so you're just saying, hey, uh, one is more vapor. 
than four. Higher energy state, higher enthalpy. True? See how we, what, it's like the quality at one. What's the quality at one compared to the quality at four? A lot greater. So, that true or not? True? True. All right. So, is this correct? Do you like this for the answer for part A? If I could just get the enthalpies, I'd be set. How do I get the enthalpy at state one? State principle, give me two properties, independent and intensive properties. I'll get the third property. You're asking me to calculate H. Do I know two others? I will, it, yeah, sometimes I'll, I like this. Get the right fluid. Don't go to the wrong table. There's no hope if you're in the 134 table and I ask you to evaluate R22, right? So get to the right fluid table, and then you want the two properties. You said that it was the temperature at uh, 2 degrees C, and because this is 2 degrees C right there, and what was this one? 52 degrees C from the problem statement. And what was that other property? S which is S2, um, uh, which is saturated uh, S of G at the 52, right? So you have to think a little bit is this S is constant. So S1 is equal to S2, and S2 is equal to S of G at the 52 degrees C. Make sense? All right. So you find H by temperature and entropy. Same thing for uh, if you need the H4. You do it the same way. It's a function of the temperature and the entropy. All right, so we calculate it that way. Now, they also, for part B, the rate of heat transfer to the refrigerant passing through the evaporator in tons of refrigeration. Somebody says a ton. You think 2,000 pounds, metric ton, right? That's 2,200 pounds, or what is it, 1,000 uh, kilos? That's a metric ton? I'm pretty sure. You're thinking mass, but you also have a ton of refrigeration. That's defined as 200 BTUs per minute of cooling or 211 kilojoules per minute of cooling. It's a rate of heat transfer. That's what a ton of refrigeration is. Okay. And so you just take that answer, Q dot evap from part A, which will be in kilowatts. And uh, let me just give you the answer for part A. Then we can talk about it more um, concretely. It's going to be um, Q dot in the evaporator is a 10.68 kilowatts. I just want the same answer, Q dot in evaporator expressed as tons of refrigeration, just T-O-N. So what I do is I multiply by 211 kilojoules per minute. I know that a kilowatt is a kilojoule per second, true? And let me get rid of this, get rid of that, make it a little easier to see. And that a uh, minute is 60 seconds. And so um, I've messed this one up, I left out my ton. A ton is 211 kilojoules per minute. I left out the ton there. Okay, so now I get rid of the kilojoules, kilowatts, seconds, minutes, boom, I have tons. And so Q dot of app comes in at 3.04 ton or tons of refrigeration. How many people know how big of an air conditioner is in the house if they live in a house, or maybe their parents have a house, or some friend of theirs has a house. Anybody know how big it is? Was that a friend's house? I said, ooh, your air conditioner seems to be a lot better. Brand new, started telling me all about it, just over the 4th of July, right? 
Well, this house isn't that big. How big is your unit? He got a two and a half ton. Pretty big unit for a small house. It was really cooling it down. Felt like a refrigerator. It was nice, right? Anybody know? What do they have in their houses that they live in? Nobody? After this class, you'll be so inquisitive. <laughs> right? You'll want to know. Now, what about the net power input to the cycle? Yes, yeah, CPS is going to have to get paid. So uh, what you do is it's uh, W dot net is mass flow rate times the compressor minus the turbine specific. And we already know what the compressor is. What was that? That was H2 minus H1. And the turbine, I know I have a negative sign in front of that, so this is a po both of these are positive works. And this is going to be an H3 uh, minus H4. Okay? You get those enthalpies. It all hinges on the enthalpies. So uh, I'm going to show the next page. But when you solve problems like this, get a good diagram, a sketch of the components, the four components, OK? What else do you get? A diagram, like a property diagram. And then get a table of the values. Organize your answers in a table, table of property values. OK. How about the very last? Coefficient of performance. It's what you desire. We wanted a large cooling in the evaporator over W dot net, net power supplied to the cycle. Here are the results for this problem. First of all, here are the dot. This is a sketch of the four major components, the labeling of where the states are. Then we have a property diagram, and it's a box, a rectangle on a TS. And here are the uh, table of properties. I put state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, pressures, temperature, temperature in Kelvin, quality, enthalpy and entropy. Notice S at 1 and 2 are the same values. S at 3 and 4 are the same values. Isn't that true? I like to add a little column over here to say, how do I fix state one? Well, state one is temperature and entropy. How about state two? Temperature and its saturated vapor. State three, it's temperature and saturated liquid. And I got like three people texting at the same time. Has anybody got a uh, syllabus with them? If you got a syllabus, open it up and you'll see what I say about texting. All right? Last warning. Don't do it. All right. And then saturated liquid, temperature and saturated liquid, fix state three. And then temperature and entropy allow you to fix and get all the properties. And the key properties to get are enthalpy because that drives it. So then I can come down here and I can get the Q of the evaporator, Q of the condenser, Q net. Work compressor, work turbine, work net, make sure that these are the same. They need to be the same, otherwise you have an error. Get the coefficient of performance, it's 505. Notice that we also compare the coefficient of performance calculated with a very simple analytic expression. It's just TL divided by TH minus TL. That was in the end of chapter, what, six or five of Thermo One? said Carnot efficiency for a heat engine, 1 minus TL over TH. Carnot efficiency of refrigeration, TL over TH minus TL. And guess what? They're the same. This is magic. You have to, I can't impress you by saying, hey, this is really surprising when you do it the first time, right? You need to do this. Has, any, has everybody done that? where they actually computed it the long way, getting the enthalpies out of the tables, and then they do the very simple formula, and it's spot on. He's like, I went, all this work, 
And yet there's a little shortcut path and it gives me the same answer. This is, this is incredible. All right. Then we calculate the uh, heat trans rate of heat transfer or the, or the heat transfer in the evaporator in kilowatts and in tons, and then the power that's going to have to be supplied to make this system run. All right? So those are the answers. You can also take and go to uh, NIST software, N-I-S-T. You can download this. It's RefProp. P-R-O-P, R-E-F, P-R-O-P. For students, you can download it for free. Just go and type into Google search mini RefProp or student version of RefProp. And then you can get the R22. It's software, just like everything else. It's a little hard to get uh, acclimated to, but it's very powerful. And you can get a plot of temperature entropy. And you can put the dome on there, just like that. And you can put a line of constant pressure. I plotted 530 kilopascal. I plotted 2,033 kilopascal. That's my high pressure. That's my low pressure. I put in 5,000 kilopascal just for visual, as well as 8,000 kilopascal for visual. And then you can also go in and evaluate particular points in this software. And what I did was I evaluated them for the cycle, and their state, what is it, uh, this, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. And you can see visually where it is. That's drawn to scale. This is the entropy, not with my cartoonish sketch, but to scale as well as temperature. Notice it's right around two degrees C, right around, what was it, 55 degrees C? 52 degrees C. Okay. And the entropy values typically don't mean much. They don't have a hard time having any physical interpretation, but there they are. It's uh, straight up and down, straight up and down. Okay. And then you, you see what the quality is for this software. This is around 28% quality. This is around 91% quality. Right here. 91, 28. All right, now I just jumped way ahead. All right. Ready to move now from Carnot, which is theoretical, to something that's practical. How can we still achieve that high performance, that high COP, but have it very practical? What what's, was not practical? This turbine is not practical. What are you ingesting into the turbine in the Carnot cycle? Saturated liquid. What are you coming out with? Low quality, two phase. That's not practical. You can't. You tell me a device, or you want to go invent one. You know. Uh, but uh, when you have a turbine, it's usually either a hydraulic turbine. It's water is always water. It's liquid, or it's a gas turbine. It's gas and it stays gas. It doesn't change phase, as well as significantly changing temperature. Remember, what temperature did it come in at? 52 degrees C. What temperature did it go out at? 2 degrees C. So what they do is they replace that turbine with just something to drop the pressure. It, it came in at 2033 kPa, and it went out at 530 kPa. So they put it through. They get rid of the turbine, and they put in an expansion valve, the restriction. All right. What's the other thing they do? Is they don't have uh, the compressor ingest high quality here. They have the compressor ingest saturated vapor. So the, sa the saturated vapor is what goes into the compressor. Well, what's going to come out of the compressor then? Superheated vapor, isn't it? So now it's going to come out superheated vapor because the compressor doesn't like to have some water droplets going into it. It wants, or some liquid droplets, it's not water, it's a refrigerant, but that's, that's the change. So that's the change for the vapor compression, the practical uh, Carnot cycle for refrigeration. What's it look like on a temperature entropy diagram? Well, let's put the same lines of pressure in. 
let's think about, yeah, this is staying at 2 degrees C. This is about 530 kPa for refrigerant 22. This one's about 52 degrees C. This is around 2,000 kPa, if my memory's correct. But where do does, where does some of these states shift? Where is state 1? Saturated vapor. It's shifted over. It used to be here, now it's over there. And if you put it through the best compressor that you can achieve, it'll be isentropic. Now the question, and this always trips students up, is they say, well, should the compressor take it to this point? Is this location of state 2? Or is the compressor take it to this point? Is that the location of state 2? Because what I want to do is I want to start condensing it. So this is a very easy clicker question, but let's go ahead and answer it. Where is state 2? Is it at location A or is it location B? Location A or location B? 50-50 chance. You like those, don't you? On a TS diagram, where is state 2? Closer to point A or closer to point B? State 3 is right here. It's saturated liquid coming out. All right. Let me ask a question. If somebody says, uh, this is a line of constant pressure around 500-something. This is a line of constant pressure around 2,000 something, right? Let's say 500 and 2,000. Could you sketch me a line of constant pressure of, let's say, 1,000? Where would, what would, what would it be? Somewhere in between. So maybe a line of 1,000 would be this way, true? Okay. Oh, what would the pressure if, at 2 be if, if, if it just happened to go right through the one What's the pressure at this 2A? Let's call it 2A. Can you see what that pressure is? Is it all the way to 2,033 kilopascal, or is it somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000? I mean, 500 and 2,000. Yeah, so it's not high enough pressure. So if somebody wants it, if they think A is the correct answer, they're thinking it's at the right temperature, it's at 52 degrees C, let's start cooling it so then we can start condensing it. The only problem is, is if I go from this point right here to that point right there, what happens to the pressure? It's going up. How's it going to go up? It's impossible. So state two is all the way up there. True? Now, that's the key to why the practical Carnot has a lower efficiency than the real Carnot. That's the reason that the vapor compression refrigeration cycle, even if we analyze it with a perfect compressor, is going to have a lot lower coefficient of performance. It's because when you have to cool it up in here, what's happening? I'm cooling it and the temperature is really high. And now I have to dump it with a large delta T, that's irreversible. All right, then we can condense, condense, and condense. Now, the other uh, reason that's um, um, lower performance is that when you put it from three to four, where, here's another question, where is state four? Used to be state four is directly under state three. Is state four going to be a little bit over to the left or a little bit over to the right? So what we'll do is we'll, an we'll give you three options. Answer A, I think it'll be a little over to the left. Answer B, I think it's still going to be straight underneath state three. Answer C, I think it'll be a little bit to the right. Where is state four? Because we got rid of the turbine and we replaced it with an expansion valve in the practical Carnot or the vapor compression refrigeration. We've replaced that turbine with an expansion valve. I 
All right, polling has stopped. Well, what we have to know is a little bit about an expansion valve. What does the pressure do? It goes down. Flow through a restriction like that, that's a source of irreversibility. I'm going to have entropy generation. The out exiting fluid is going to have a higher S. Why? Because there's entropy generated within, and how is it going to go out but being swept out with the fluid? So, C. That's where state four is. It's going to be moved over to the right more, correct? And so that's going to be the new state four. Now, should I draw a solid line or a dashed line from three to four? And what does the dashed line indicate in thermodynamic textbooks? It's a path that's uh, uh, showing irreversible expansion or irreversible process. And so there you go. I put a lot of lines on here. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Get rid of all this. And so what does the cycle look like? It goes up, comes down along a line of constant pressure. Then it's horizontal as it's condensing. Then we have a dash line, expansion, a higher S, and then we bring it across for evaporation. That's what the cycle looks like on a TS diagram. Once you figure that out, you then can solve a lot of problems. And here's the comparison again. There's my dome. Where is state one? Right there. Where is state two? somewhere like that. Now, if that compressor had an isentropic efficiency with the compressor, maybe it was 80% isentropic efficiency, then I would talk about state 2S, which is straight above state 2, and then I would have 2 actual to be even worse. I mean, it would be up here, 2 actual, meaning it's worse, hence it's higher temperature coming out, and I'm going to have a greater delta T when I uh, cool it in that heat exchanger, that, uh, that, that condenser. All right, so then you cool it, condense it down to three, put it through an expansion valve across. And then this is for, uh, would they ever give an isentropic efficiency of the expansion valve? Nonsense, never heard of anything like that. It's just a restriction. Okay, there's no isentropic, there is isentropic efficiencies often specified for compressors. Okay. But even if this is 100% the coefficient of performance for the vapor compression refrigeration cycle will not be as good as the coefficient of performance for the Carnot uh, refrigeration cycle. It won't, it won't be as good. And the two reasons, the expansion valve and that cooling of that inlet to the condenser is above the saturation temperature. So there's a higher delta T there. This is always an intriguing question. Professor, you have an expansion valve. You explain that thing is so simple. I bring in some fluid at high pressure. What was our pressure? 2,033 kilopascal. It goes out low pressure. F uh, what did I? 530 kilopascal. I could understand why the fluid wants to flow in that direction. High pressure inlet, low pressure outlet makes sense to me. It's a restriction. There's a pressure drop across it. It's like a partially closed valve, a metering device. It comes in, though, Professor. 52 degrees C, that's hot. It goes out, Professor, 2 degrees C, that's cold. There must be some heat transfer to cool it in the expansion valve. Otherwise, why does it come out 2 degrees C? Or maybe all of engineering is just magic, and I just take tests, and I regurgitate material to make professors happy. I get the diploma, but I don't, you know, I don't really don't believe it. So what's going on here? It's a pressure drop. We know, yeah. Is it because the particles are contained in a less dense area, 
This, this will have a, le a lower density, that's true, true, and the specific volume will have increased, that's true. Well, this is one of those where that's kind of in the right area, but um, probably that terminology wouldn't set well with a lot of people. It doesn't set well with me, uh, but friction and molecules. But there's another thing between molecules. If you talk to your chemist class or something, you, you were exposed to these concepts. What's happening between molecules? There's forces. Bonds and forces between them, true? And then you can look inside a molecule and you say, oh, the molecule has a hydrogen and oxygen, and there's also forces inside the molecule, true? But the forces inside the molecule are typically very, very strong, and the forces between molecules are very weak, weak forces and strong forces, right? So if you burn something, let's say I have a carbon and hydrogen, and I combust it, I can have a lot of heat release when I break those bonds of the methane molecule and rearrange it to make carbon dioxide and water vapor with oxygen, okay? But um, what I have here is I have a refrigerant coming through, and the refrigerant is not changing. It's staying the refrigerant, so it's not those stronger than, and the hydrogen and the fluorine or whatever else is in the chlorine that's in the refrigerant. We're not changing the refrigerant. It's the same there, okay? But what's happening is, is we're changing forces. So what we have is we have intermolecular between molecules. They often, in the liquid state, are attraction. Forget about repulsion. Just it's attraction. That's what keeps it in the liquid state. When they go and drop the pressure, it's like, hey, I really feel lit. You know, it's like you moved away from home and now you're a first semester college student. There's no parent to tell me what time to go to bed. Yeehaw! <laughs> Woohoo! I can stay up till midnight. 1 a.m., <laughs> here I come. 2 a.m., all right. And so anyway, there's this, uh, it's a lower pressure. They just feel like they don't need to be stuck near each other. But it's going to take energy to break those f bonds or those that attract, that stick togetherness energy um, that just needs to be broken. Where is that energy going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the internal energy of the fluid. It's going to drop the temperature. And so it's, it's kind of like this. What was the quality here? Maybe the quality is 20%. What does the quality of 20% mean? It's a mass fraction saying that 20% is vapor and 80% is liquid. That means that 20% really lost it, right? I had one student one time. I said, hey, you were in my class last semester. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I said, what happened to you? You were doing good, and then gone. He said, I turned 21. <laughs> and man, did I party. Well, I'm glad to see you again. I hope it doesn't happen this semester. <laughs> Seriously, it was like, what? You really? You tell me. Yeah, it wasn't nothing about your class. I just turned 21. <laughs> and I really let it rip. So anyway, the 20% turned 21. They let it rip all-nighters and everything else, now they're all in the vapor state, and the 80% stayed at home, and maybe they got texts from their mother, are you in bed yet? You know, <laughs> you know go to sleep, you have an exam tomorrow. Anyway, these, this, these uh, uh, are colder, and that energy is transferred so these can be liberated, and they have no bonds between them, okay? They're, they're floating around at the uh, uh, same time, same pressure, same temperature, but they're in the vapor state. And so they don't have that strong intermolecular bonds or forces of attraction to keep them there. Okay. Well, what I like to do, and if you've had me before, good. But this here is a can that, uh, of refrigerant 134A. It's uh, sold so that you can spray it on keyboards or 
monitors or inside your computer, <laughs> whoo, that was great. And uh, it gets the dust away, right? Blows away dust. It's made to use in the upright position. Inside this can, I'll pass it around. You can slosh it. And when you feel some sloshing inside, what is that telling you about the fluid inside? Some is liquid and some is vapor. And you can feel that sloshing of the liquid going back and forth. And so, so when I hold it upright, the vapor's at the top. When I turn it upside down, the vapor's still at the top, but now the bottom of the can is up at the top, right? So what happens is, is it's supposed to be shot this way where the handle is compressed and this is the gravity. And so what sprays out? The vapor that's at the top. Just psh, psh, psh. And that's what I just did. I sprayed the vapor at the top. Okay. There's a great pressure change between the inside and the outside. Okay. But if what comes into this valve is vapor and goes out the valve is vapor, there's a not a large temperature change. So... This can of refrigerant 134A, is it hot or is it cold? Is it the same temperature as the air in this room or is it different temperature than the air in this room? Right now, right now, the inside fluid inside that canister, what is the temperature of the refrigerant in this canister compared to the temperature of the air in this room? Ooh. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> Really? All right, I got some exams here. I'm shaking them. I got one exam in the middle. What's the temperature? Did it just drop temperature because I shook it? Sorry, uh, uh, Prince. Uh, I just shook your exam and it's cold. it dropped temperature. Come on now. What is the temperature of the exam on this prop of the stack compared to the temperature of the air in the room? How about the temperature of the middle exam? Temperature of the can, the outside of the can. Temperature of the fluid inside the can. <laughs> Why would it be this, not anything but the same? It's sat in this room for a long time. It's thermal equilibrium. Nothing to prevent heat transfer. If it was colder, it would warm up. Did I say the pressure in the fluid inside the can is the same? No. And when I squeeze a little trigger, some fluid rushes out because it's high pressure inside. And so some fluid comes out. Now, I know that was hard to get that, but you've got to get all that because now you turn it upside down. You're devious. When you turn it upside down and you want the can to be like this, and there's the little trigger mechanism, and you press the trigger, uh, this is now all liquid on the influence of gravity. Here's the vapor. What's going to come across that valve? Liquid. So I'm going to pass this around, and you can hold it up outside, right side, and you can spray out on the keyboard. Don't not put on your friends or anything like that. <laughs> and you can feel that it's about to, but do not. Turn it upside down and spray it on your hand or skin or your friend or anything else. What you got to do is you got to spray it into a napkin that I brought. I hope I brought. You know what? It's in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, you have to be very careful because you can get a freezer burn on your fingers because it's going to be cold. Professor. The refrigerant that's in this can right now is room temperature. Somehow it's going to magically make it cold. That's, that's the magic of refrigeration. It really is. And so you just spray it like that a little bit, and then you just touch it. And I would like everybody to sense how cold that is. Sometimes seeing is believing. Sometimes feeling is believing. All right? That's right. That's what that is. That, that's a throttling process right in here on that valve when you crack it open a little bit. And so it rushes out. So now we want to do is we want to solve a problem, but with this uh, vapor compression refrigeration system. Well, 
Here is the, the sketch of the uh, diagram, TS diagram. Get uh, states. Notice that state one now is saturated vapor. Get your enthalpies. You keep going down. Careful. Oh, you're cleaning your keyboard. Smart. <laughs> I don't have that much of <laughs> clean. clean your keyboard. Um, uh, so make a nice table and then compute uh, all of the things, the same things we asked for before the rate of heat transfer in the evaporator, how much net power to drive it. Notice that W dot to drive it is only to drive the compressor. There's no power coming back from the expansion valve. There's no more turbine to help contribute to the drive the compressor. And then the coefficient of performance. It's, it's not going to be as high coefficient of performance for the same uh, evaporator temperature as well as the condenser temperature. Okay. You can plot this on a TS diagram. And what I did was I put it on the same one where before, but here I didn't have time. I should have put a point here and then a point there and made that blue line come down and then come across. But oh well, it plotted a straight line. It's not condensing that way. It is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's going to come down and then go across. And then you see how much the change in the quality is because you didn't put it through an expensive turbine, but you just put it through an expansion valve. That's not that great a shift in quality, is it? You would think that that would more seriously degrade the performance, but it's, it really visually you can see it's not. So what is constant between state 3 and state 4? It's enthalpy at 3 is equal to the enthalpy at 4 through that expansion process, not S3 is equal to S4. Before, it was S3 equal to S4. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about home air conditioning systems because I hope that uh, you can not only solve the problems, but then uh, when you graduate from this class, I always tell people uh, you're going to go home and they're going to ask you questions like, oh, what are you studying? Oh, I'm a mechanical engineering major. <laughs> oh, what, what type of things do you learn? And then as soon as they figure out that, uh, that you learned anything about air conditioning, they say, I got a problem. <laughs> Here's my problem. And literally, my uh, daughter that's uh, married, they bought a condo. That I was on the phone with them back and forth because their air conditioner, of course, the brand new condo they bought doesn't work. It's new to them, but it's an old unit. And so diagnosing things and helping them, they got it fixed. But over the phone, you know, sometimes you have to help people. And that's what you're equipped with, the skills to help people and solve problems. So let's understand how air conditioning system works. This illustration's out of, off a of Goodman manufacturing site. Anybody heard of Goodman? They don't advertise a lot, but they have a large residential sh or share of the residential air conditioning system. Where are their headquarters? A little city east of here on I-10 before you hit uh, Beaumont. Uh, it's the little city east of here that's twice our size. Houston, it's the headquarters are in, I'm trying to be cute, it's in Houston, all right. <laughs> it's in Houston, it's their headquarters, okay? And uh, they, they make very good equipment and that's nice. Uh, there's a lot of units, if you have a replacement unit or if you go outside and you say, what, what is the unit for my apartment or what is the unit for my house or my parents' house or my friend's house? You know, you may just go around and look, okay? And, see, and it could be a Goodman. So what do we have is we have the house and outside, tucked away in the side or in the back, is an outdoor unit or the condensing unit. And then it has some lines that carry a refrigerant both in and out of the house. It makes a loop. So one line carries it in, one line carries it out. And it goes up, maybe it's into the attic, uh, maybe it's into a closet, Maybe somewhere it's, it's, it's in, often they stick them in the attics because uh, square footage inside your house is valuable and you want as much. And so if it takes up a closet, people aren't as happy. They'd rather have that closet space. But older homes, they would put them in the closet. And so it'd be vertical in the closet somewhere instead of horizontal up in the attic. So that line set's got to get up there. Okay, then you have the air. It's ingested somewhere. Maybe it's ingested in the ceiling. 
Maybe they have a little filter, or maybe they have it on the side of the wall, it goes up the wall, it goes into the unit, and it goes across some coil, the indoor coil, and it gets cooled. And then that air gets distributed into different parts of the house. Usually have a duct system run in the attic. Okay. Sometimes in apartments they have drop ceilings in the hallway. Or in houses, drop ceilings, and they run it in that drop ceiling area. Um, in this room right here, you can look and you can see where the air is coming in. You know, one, two, right up here in the front, and, and all over. Now, it also has to get out of this room. Uh, if you look right there, there's one, two, three. Those are return air grills, okay? So the air gets thrown in. Hopefully, the cold air sinks down to you, makes you happy, and then the hot air rises and then is drawn out and returned there. What about in the house? Well, don't keep your door shut or make sure there's a good gap under your door, bedroom door. Otherwise, it seals it if you shut your door. And usually the open doors and hallways are returns back to this grill right here or in the ceiling. Okay? So that's your whole building or your whole house is your return duct for the air. So that's the air. It's making that loop. But in the refrigerant, because once it's through this indoor coil, it goes back and back down to the condensing unit. Now, there's one big piece of machinery that consumes a lot of energy. It's called the compressor. When it runs, it's loud. It's doing a lot of work. So often they put it outside. It's hot. They want to reject heat to the outside. And they have a fan right here. And it sucks in outdoor air across the heat surface, heat, heat exchanger surface, uh, the coils. And then it's blown out. And the compressor usually sits in the mid middle. Let's take a look here. Here is an exploded view of that condensing unit, all right? You have a compressor sitting in the middle. You have wrap around almost all the time. A very large percent is a coil for heat transfer. It draws air in across it. The fan blows it out the top, blows it out the top, draws air in and blows it out the top. And so on a hot day, maybe it's 100 degrees in San Antonio. Would you like your home air conditioner to work? Yes, you would. How about a 105 degree day in San Antonio? Yeah, I really want it to work. How about 110? Every now and then it may get 108. Very rarely does it ever get that hot, true? But let's say uh, this needs to reject the heat to very hot. Let's say 110 degrees F, you're the design engineer. I want that thing to work. I don't want any phone calls saying it's the hottest day and your equipment you sold me now decided to take a vacation. That's not going to work. So what temperature do you think the refrigerant is in this coil in here if it's dumping heat to the air that's coming in at 110? About 130. So that refrigerant's about 130 degrees F or something in that vicinity. And so then the air gets warmed up and maybe it comes in 110, maybe it leaves 115 or 120. So you see that the, it, it's making the outdoor air hotter, right? But that's where you have to reject the heat to. So this makes noise, this makes noise, it builds the pressure, it's high pressure in this condenser coil because that's what's happening to the fluid. It's cooling off the refrigerant, then it's condensing the refrigerant. Then it's ready to go through one of these lines back. And then after it goes up inside the house, it, then the refrigerant comes back in another line. So one line takes the refrigerant into the house. One line takes the refrigerant from the house back to the uh, condensing unit. First thing it does, once it comes in, it goes over to the compressor boost the pressure. After the compressor, it goes to the coil. After the coil, it goes into the line to go back. You see that? Yeah. Notice that some apartments have very small little guys. Some have big units. Also, the size uh, is an indication of the efficiency. These numbers, like a 13 and a 15 and a 20, uh, are indications of efficiencies of the unit. This is higher efficiency. 
It's like uh, working out with steroids or something. It's like muscle up. It's, they get very big and they have gotten a lot bigger over the years. As engineers have been pushed to produce higher and higher efficiency units for the same tonnage. What are they doing? They're making more coil space. Help promote the heat transfer at a smaller delta T. Smaller delta T. Okay. They'll also put a, comp a con um, compressor in there, which is a variable speed compressor. Used to be it just turned on, it was on 100%, all out. Even if it was a modest day, maybe it's only you know, 85 degrees outside. You just need a little air conditioning. It's not 105 outside. Well, they have variable speed compressors. The engineers found out you can boost efficiency with that. All right. Uh, what's in the inside, this one would be in the closet. Sometimes they call it indoor furnace or the indoor unit. Uh, they will have uh, a coil on there, just like the coil outside. The inside one, it's hard to see. It's like even my wife is helping her figure out what's wrong with the condo. It's like you could not see the coil, the indoor coil. I'm saying that thing is clogged up. You need to have it the contractor come, pull the indoor coil, and clean it. And it's like, well, brr, 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 brr. anyway, it's an expensive process. It's hard to see that coil on the inside. The coil on the inside sits in your ductwork, and often it sits in this shape like this. So the air will come up with a blower. It'll be ingested. Some air come in this plenum area. Get a filter. Always, always, always check and replace your filters. Then it goes through a blower, then it goes through the coil, and then up into the duct system. Okay? So when it passes over the coils, it's cooled. It cools air. They call it the cooling coil. It's shaped in a letter upside down. V, if you look like that, it looks now like an A. They call it the A coil. It blows like that. A lot of them are situated like this. Not all, but some. So that's what's happening to cool the air that then gets distributed to the house. So that's the line set. This is your condensing unit. The compressor is sitting there. The refrigerant flows this way and that way. And the evaporator is right here. That's your evaporator. Where's the expansion valve? Close to the evaporator. As soon as it expands and drops pressure, it's ready to cool. True? When it went into that napkin that I passed around, did you sense how cold it was right away? It's ready to cool. This is what an A-coil looks like. It's uh, sealed up on this side, sealed up on the top. It's sealed around the edges for the duct that it comes in. Air comes up in the middle, and then it flows over and out. You go on the internet and just type, show me a picture of a clogged A-coil. It's nasty. Okay? And it gets matted up because they, the filter didn't get changed or bypassed the filter. You had a cat, you had a dog, or you just have lint and other stuff, and it mats up there. Okay. You also, on this tray, have an, a hose here and a hose here. That's not for refrigerant. That's for water. It's for condensate. So you have a little tray that uh, catches it on the side, brings it over, and then typically puts it out to drip somewhere on the outside of the house. Anybody remember when you visited or you were first time you're exploring the neighborhood in your backyard and then you run into your mother and say, Mom, Mom, we got a problem. We got water dripping on the outside of your house. There's a big puddle, Mom. Come look. Nobody had that experience? Yeah, it's like, hey, something's going on. There's a hose sticking out the side of your house and it's just dripping water right now. Come look. And you go out there, and it's the air conditioner running, and it's dehumidifying that indoor air, and it has to drain that water, and typically they just drip it somewhere outside, okay? And it's always something like, whoa, where's this water come from? If you have a house and that gets clogged up, the tray will overflow. So most of the time, they have two of them. One's a little lower in elevation than the other, and then they have alarm system. If the first one gets clogged, the alarm, and then a technician comes out. Because they didn't used to have that, if it just got clogged, it went over the edge, and now you got 
water dripping through the sheetrock or somewhere else in your house that you don't want it. Anybody had that experience? Yeah, it's a very common experience. And so when the technician installs a new unit for your, when, after you get a job, you get rich, and you have a nice house, blah, 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 make sure it's all alarmed so that you avoid that a very expensive uh, problem. This is another one. So now let's take a look at the refrigerant passages through this. What happens is refrigerant's going to come in, and it looks like it's going to pass through these, these tubes right here in this heat exchanger going back and forth and it's finned. The fins on the heat exchanger help promote. Anybody going to take heat transfer or already took it? You learn about fins? Yeah? Heat conduction and fins? There's a lot of heat, heat transfer promoted with fins. So the refrigerant loops back and forth. What happens is it comes in somewhere and it goes out somewhere. Here it's coming out one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six separate passageways collected in a manifold and then tucked out of here. All right, back. How does it come in? Well, it comes in and it's going to go through. It's hard to see. It's going to come through an expansion valve, and this is a, an expansion valve. And then it's going to split. And there, notice there's, uh, you can barely see in one, two, three little lines. One, two, three little lines, and those are the six lines that feed separate parts of the evaporator, and then they're tracked and they have six lines going out. There's a difference in the diameter. Hmm, just take a look. This line right here. What about the diameter of that one versus one of these? Which one's larger diameter? Which one's the inlet? Which one's the outlet? Larger is the outlet. Because it's an evaporator, what happened to the refrigerant going through it? It evaporated, it expanded, needs more space. The same mass flow rate in each of those lines, one little little bitty line versus one big line, same mass flow rate, same mass flow rate. Okay? All right. Sometimes you'll see more of this. It's a mini split. Anybody live in a house? where if you walk into the house and it's dark and you have a switch on the side of the wall, you can switch it and it turns on the lights in the room. Anybody live in a house where they have a light switch? Okay. How many people live in a house where there's one and only one light switch? You walk in the house, you turn on the light switch and all the lights in the house, every room gets all lit up at once. Anybody live in a house like that? Why? Because your parents would be saying, turn off the light when you leave that room. And everybody told you that, true? It'd be raceful in energy. All the lights, you don't need to be in that back bedroom right now. Nobody's back there. You want one light switch turn off on all the lights, turn on all the lights in the whole house. That don't make any sense. All right, well, we live in homes where they set it up where you walk in, you turn the switch to say, make it cold, and every room gets air conditioned. And I think you'll see more and more of these mini splits, maybe. Uh, I know a lot of companies are heavily invested in it. One of the students who graduated took class just like this class from me in this university is working for, I forget the company, Hibachi, Hitachi, ah, Japanese owned, but they're heavy into the mini splits. Uh, development, and that's what he's been doing for his whole career in Houston. Um, but anyway, uh, these uh, mini splits are basically to be in zones. So you'll have the outdoor unit with the condenser, but you may have multiple line sets running to different air handlers, which are smaller, and they're targeted to that room. So if you're only in that bedroom, only run the AC in the bedroom. If you're in the living room, run that. And so they'll have them split like that. I think you'll just find that it's much more efficient because if you can turn off refrigerant, the, the air conditioning in the whole area, it saves a lot of money. It will save a lot of money. Right? What's the difference in the miles per gallon of a vehicle that's parked, the Hummer that's parked in your driveway, versus the miles per gallon of the vehicle that's parked? I'm talking miles per gallon in the sense of the economy. But if they're both parked and turned off, they're not doing anything. They're not using any gas. The same thing with this. If it's turned off, it's not using any electricity. It's not costing you. But some people really like to live in a refrigerator. Well, if you're watching a movie in that room, turn it down to 70 and enjoy. 
And if you go back to sleep in this back bedroom or some other room, turn it down to 70 and put a parka on and sleep and let the rest of the house stay warm. Quick clicker question. Had this diagram, and now the question is, is, is the compressor where A is, where B is, where C is, where D is, or where E is? Where is the compressor? Did I hit it to, to start it? Oh, I didn't. It didn't start. I hit it, but it didn't start. The compressor is where it draws all that electricity. It's push, It's either a reciprocating compressor or a scroll compressor. It's getting hot. And it's, you want to put it right away from the compressor into the condensing coil. So it's B. What is A pointing to? The line set that carries the fluid back and forth from the house. B. Next question, where is the evaporator? Is it A, C, B, E, or D, the evaporator? So uh, where it evaporates is where it cools the air blowing over it. And also, the evaporator is typically wet because if there's any humidity in the air, it can starts to feel that presence of that cold surface, that cold fin surface, and it wants to deposit some moisture on it, and then you have to get that water out of it. And so, uh, A, it's where it's, the evaporator is. True? A. Where is the expansion valve? The expansion valve. Is it A, B, C, D, or E? Expansion valve. Well, as soon as that refrigerant that we passed that can, as soon as that refrigerant came into that napkin, did it take a while for it to get cold? It was pretty prompt, wasn't it? As soon as you drop that pressure of the refrigerant, it's ready to cool the air that flows over it. So uh, it's going to be right up adjacent to that A coil, that evaporator coil. Okay, that's where that is. What did that look like? It had those six little lines coming out of it to feed different parts of the A coil. All right. Where is the condenser? Condenser. Is it A, uh, B, C, D, or E? Where is the condenser? When you, uh, when you work through in your own mind, the naming of the evaporator and the condenser are linked to what's happening to the refrigerant inside that heat exchanger. 
inside the condenser, that's a heat exchanger, what is the refrigerant doing? Condensing. When it condenses, it's at high pressure and it's dumping heat out of it. It's heat transfer out of the refrigerant as it's condensing. The other one is called the evaporator. What's happening to the refrigerant in that heat exchanger called evaporator? Evaporating. It takes energy to boil it or evaporate it. So it's low pressure, low temperature, and it's evaporating, cooling the air inside. So this right here is the condenser. High pressure rejecting heat to the outdoor air. Got it? All right. Last, no, wrap it up here. We talk about packaged air conditioning systems. Most of the time, sometimes you'll see that in the commercial world. If you walk into a big warehouse, shopping warehouse, a Sam's or Walmart or something, they have a high ceiling. Where's all the air conditioning happening? Well, they put package units on the roof. Now, on the roof, what they do is they just have the air sucked in some way and then blowing out another way. It can be very crude or it can have a little ductwork to it. But up in here, they have the compressor in a package with the evaporator in a package with the condenser in a package with the, that's why they call it a package unit. It's all packaged together, one unit. With a crane, they can just plop it on the roof, okay? And it brings in air and it throws out air. Now, for a house, normally we have indoor unit, outdoor unit, line set, refrigerant makes the travel some distance. But you can also get a packaged unit for your house. It's rare. I've seen it, but it's rare. And you would get all the air to go out of the house into the package unit, cool it, and bring all the air back into the house. So you would have no refrigerant going in or out of your house. You would just have cool and warm air going in and out of your house. But uh, this package units are more common for commercial, especially if you look at a roof, they have a whole pile of them, you know, large building. And if one unit goes down, well, you can still keep the building pretty cool while they replace it. So you have a package system versus a split system. Why do they call it split? The two big heat exchangers are separated. The evaporator is far from the condenser. The packaged, it's all together. The evaporator, the condenser, the compressor, all together. Automobiles, how many people, I should ask the opposite question, how many people own a vehicle with no operating air conditioning in it? Not at all, none at all. Do you really? It's broken, it's sitting there on blocks at your house. I, you too, huh? Anybody else? One person. One person sweats it out in San Antonio and drives a vehicle. Is everybody else that rich? That you don't, you, you all have actually operating vehicles that have operating air conditioning systems to it. You should pop the hood and take a look. It's very interesting. And you now are equipped with the knowledge to say, show me the compressor. Where is that compressor? There's usually a belt driving it off of the crank. That's a key. Look for the crank of the engine. Look for a belt. Look for a compressor. There'll be a power steering pump. There'll be an electric uh, alternator, but there'll be a compressor as well. Then there'll be a line coming out to a coil that's in the front. Typically, it's in front of the radiator. It's hard to see sometimes. It has a fan that electrically operated or mechanically operated. That you have to reject the heat to the air outside. Put it in the front. That's where they're at. Is that a condenser or an evaporator that's in the front? What's happening to the refrigerant is it's condensing and it's dumping heat to the outdoor air. Then you have a line that goes typically through a filter dryer. Then some expansion valve to control it. It's a metering device very close to the evaporator, which is usually inside the, the body of the car in the dash underneath somewhere and there's a blower motor and, and uh, draws in air down by your feet and then blows it over the evaporator and then splashes it out through the duct system uh, toward the occupants okay so um, 
This typically is a squirrel cage blower, just like the blower in your house, blower motor. And then you should be able to say, where is, what line has high pressure? What line has low pressure? And does any line have intermediate pressure? There's only two pressures. It's a very simple system. You have high pressure, low pressure. That's it. There's no third pressure, fourth pressure, fifth pressure. Just where is my high pressure line and my low pressure line? Often you can find service caps where you can tap in. And if you ever take it somewhere, they usually diagnose it by putting hoses and connecting. Anybody ever recharge air conditioning system? One, two, three, four, five. That's it. Never recharge? Go have a friend that does it and watch them. Okay, it's easy. A lot of people are doing it this time of year. They're limping along their air conditioner system. I can get one more season out of it. Buy a $10 can of refrigerant 134A and then put it in in the beginning of the summer and hopefully by September it's still blowing cold air. Leaks aren't that bad, true? And then uh, so they tap on high pressure line, low pressure line. You should be able to sense where it's hot, where it's cold. I had a student in the class, he was uh, worked in the uh, uh, repair business for air conditioners, automotive air conditioning repair uh, for many years, multiple years. He's getting his me mechanical engineering degree. He debated with me in a lecture like this, I'm speeding up because I want to pass back the exams. It was like, no, no, the refrigerant doesn't go that direction. I know, I work on these things. So he worked on them for mul many years and in his mind, he had it going the wrong way. I was able to convince him, but you should be able to think, okay, immediately after the compressor, where does the refrigerant go? Inside the car, to the unit inside, or to that coil that's sitting in front of the radiator? In his mind, right immediately after the compressor, it went inside the unit. He had it going this way in his mind. And no, 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 when it comes out of the compressor, it's piping hot. You can, you, you can maybe grab one of those lines. You won't hold it very long if it's running. It's hot. It's not, it's going to go to be condensed. The other line coming into the compressor is typically cool. It actually sweats a little bit. You'll see drops of well, uh, perspiration from the air. You know, it's condensing a little bit from the hot, humid air around it. Often those lines are insulated because it doesn't help to condense the outdoor air. You want to keep it cool. So take a look. You should be able to say, where is the refrigerant hot? Where is it high pressure? Where is it cool? Where is it low pressure? And diagnose the systems. All right, let's stop here, and then we'll go back over the exams.